Well, good morning and welcome to Scotts Hill. So glad to see all of you here. If you're a first time guest, my name is Phil Ortigo. I serve as a senior pastor at Scotts Hill and so glad that you're able to join us. Those of you who are watching us online, thank you for inviting us into your home. And let me give a shout out to my wife who's actually in Mexico this morning. She's watching right now. Honey, I picked out my own clothes and this is what I've chosen today. All right. I hope you approve. If you don't, too bad you're not here. So... But we do want to remind you of the fact that as you look around, you can see that our, our, our room is full and it's full both in 11 o'clock, it's full in this service. We used to have three services um, before COVID. We slowly have gotten back into our two full services, but we have a community that's fastly growing around us. You're seeing that homes are being built, new neighborhoods are being established, and we've got folks that are moving in. Scotts Hill has always been a bedroom community. We are our own community now. And finally, we have the opportunity to minister to people in our community. And on April the 2nd, we are going to have our church family go out and pass out these wonderful little gift bags that we're going to be giving to all the new uh, residents of our new community. And in these gift bags, they're going to have a bag of popcorn that's going to be produced by some company. There's going to be a gift card for coffee. There's going to be chocolates. There's going to be a candle. There's going to be some information about the spring fling that we're going to be having our annual Easter egg gathering. It's not a hunt. When you've got 30,000 eggs, you don't have to look for them, right? <laughs> And so you just pick them up and harvest them is what you do. And so we're going to have the opportunity to do all of those things. And we want to put this in the hands of the new people in our community and welcome them to come join us. Now, if you look around, you might say, where are we going to put them? It's a great question. We're launching the Crosspoint Center on April the 10th. And we need 150 people to make a commitment to be a part of that Crosspoint Center launch. The room holds 400 people. We can get 400, and we will get 400 in there on Easter Sunday. But we need at least 75 people from this service, 75 people from the 11 o'clock service to say, you know what, I'll go be a part of that. I'll give up my seat so we can reach more people in this room and continue to reach our community. And once we do that, then the Crosspoint Center is going to gain the momentum as well. And so we want to ask you to be a part of that. Then on Easter Sunday, we're doing multiple services as we always do. But because of the way we're doing it, we're going to need you to go online and register and reserve a seat for yourself on Easter Sunday morning. We're going to have multiple services. You're going to have more information about that. Um, and we're going to give you the opportunity to say, hey, let me go ahead and sign up for this service in this room or this room. And so we're going to need you to do that. Easter Sunday is usually a huge time in the life of our church. We've had as many as six services here on Easter Sunday morning. And so we want to encourage you to be a part of that and join in with that. Man, that was a huge service announcement that I've just gotten through. Okay, but very exciting things. We have been going through the book of John. And, it's, and, and I've always said it's going to be a challenge. We finished Revelation in December, and then we come from the highs of Revelation, and then we're like, how do, you, how do you cap that? How do you go beyond the book of Revelation? So we've done a prequel, which is moving from Revelation to the Gospel of John, since John wrote Revelation. And so we've been looking at, in John's Gospel, a number of portraits of the, the, the picture of who Jesus Christ is. Because we're living in a culture that is filled with so many different approaches of who Jesus is, what do we think he is? We want to get back to say, what does God's word say about who he is? And as we've been going through this study, we've been looking at these snapshots of Jesus all through the book of John. We began by saying that he is both God and man, where John begins. We see, secondly, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We saw that he's a patient teacher in John chapter 3 as he meets with Nicodemus, one of the wise men of Israel. We see also that Jesus is countercultural in John chapter 4. He didn't follow all the taboos of his day, but meeting the woman at the well, he broke every taboo to reach people with the good news that the Father loves them. And then we come to John chapter 5, and we discovered this man who is in a multitude of people, and that Jesus has the ability to see the one in the midst of a crowd. And then in John chapter 6, we begin seeing these I am statements that Jesus makes through the book of John. They're unique to the book of John. There's seven I am statements that he makes. When you get to chapter 6, 
you find that John begins to connect Jesus with all the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites when they were delivered from Egypt by Moses. In John chapter 6, he begins by feeding 5,000 people. And then he relates it to the manna in the wilderness. And then Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And everybody knew exactly what he was talking about. And then in John chapter 7 is this festival. It's called the Festival of Booths or the Festival of Tabernacles. Again, it is connected to the wilderness wanderings. And there's a picture there of water coming from the rock. And Jesus calls out this huge invitation. All who come to me, from you will flow rivers of living water. And then at the end of John chapter 7, there is another event that takes place. It actually sets up the scene for John chapter 8, where we're going today. So if you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12. In John chapter 8, beginning in verse 12, it's really important that we understand the context about what we're going to read. You see, the festival of tabernacles ended this way. After the pouring of the water and the celebrating, that night... All the people of Israel would gather in the temple, but they would gather in what was known as the court of women. The court of women had 13 treasury boxes all around it. You remember the widow's mite? That's where this took place. And in all these treasure boxes, the people would gather. But it was a court that women could participate in. They couldn't go beyond that. The first court was the court of the Gentiles. The next court was the court of women. And then the next court was going into the temple temple proper. All the women are gathered there. All of Israel are gathered together and they bring in these huge candelabras. And these candelabras have all these candles on them and they're put all through the court of women and they begin to light the candelabras. And then all of a sudden, the entire court is illuminated at night. There is this festival of lights that is going on. And the people are singing that God is our light and our salvation. The people are singing, they're dancing, they're shouting. The light is spreading all into the courtyards. It's going down the streets. Every alley in that area is illuminated with light. And this is this incredible party. Everyone is singing. They're celebrating. They're dancing. Even the most dignified people among these leaders were dancing with great joy. And everyone's singing that God is our light and our salvation. Then they go to their house. It's the next morning, John chapter 8. And this taking place in the court of women. Last week we saw where Jesus deals with the woman who is caught in adultery. It was in the court of women. And what's interesting about John chapter 8 is it begins with people wanting to stone someone, and it ends with people wanting to stone Jesus. It begins with these men who bring their stones to the court of women and want to stone a woman caught in adultery. John chapter 8 ends with the Pharisees who brought their stones with them and wanting to stone Jesus. Let me tell you what was really interesting about this. I've never seen this before. Chapter 8 begins with wanting to stone, and it ends with wanting to stone. It begins with them wanting to stone people in God's house. And let me tell you, the stones were not there. They brought the stones with them. You know what it reminds me of? How easy it is for us to come to church with stones in our pockets. Have you noticed that? How easy it is for us to come to church ready to criticize, to complain, to lob our complaints against people. Maybe I don't like the music. I'm going to throw a few stones. Maybe I, I don't like that, 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 that youth teacher. I'm going to throw a few stones. Maybe I don't like the way they're doing the nursery. I'm going to throw a few stones. I don't like the pastor. I'm going to throw boulders, you know. <laughs> but the reality is we got to be careful. This is not the place to bring stones. This is the place for us to be living stones and to come in and worship the Lord together. But it begins like that. This great illumination has taken place. All the people are gathered back the next morning. And what does Jesus begin with? In verse 20, it says, These words he spoke in the treasury, in the court of women. 
and he taught them in the temple. What does he say in this room where the celebration of light had taken place? John tells us. And Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is the second I am statement. The first one was, I am the bread of life. They knew exactly what he was talking about. And when he says in this passage, I am the light of the world, Jesus was making it very clear that he was associating himself with God. Because when they celebrated that all these lights, they were celebrating God as the pillar of fire in the wilderness, leading the people through the wilderness. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, many people thought that was bold, but most people thought it was blasphemous. How dare you do that? Are you saying that you are God? I want to show you three things in this passage that when Jesus says, I'm the light of the world, And whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What is he saying in these passages? Let me give you three things. Here's the first thing. Jesus proclaims his own deity. Without any question, Jesus proclaims his own deity. Jesus is saying, yes, I am the light of the world. Anytime people said that light, they referred to God. And the Messiah was always seen as the light of the world in every single case. And we see that Jesus is unashamedly saying that he is God. Now, there are three things that come out to this. The first thing is this. He's speaking of his essence. His essence is the same as the Father. We see this in John chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In verse 1-9, it says, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Jesus is identifying himself with God. Matter of fact, the Old Testament prophets said the same thing. Isaiah says this in chapter 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a what? Great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. What is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, the light has come into the world. I and the Father are the same. We are of the same essence. And I represent all the glorious attributes of his being. When you see me, you have seen the light of the Father. He's talking of his essence. But not only that, he's talking of his extension. He's not only the light, but listen, he's the light of what? The world. He's the light of the world. He's not just the light of the Jews. He's not just the light of the Israelites. He's the light of the whole world. We see this, that after he is born, Mary and Joseph bring him to the temple. And after eight days, he is to be circumcised. They bring their two turtle doves because they were a very poor family. It was the only thing they can afford. And while they're there, this old man by the name of Simeon sees them. You remember Simeon? And the Holy Spirit tells Simeon that you're not going to die until you see my Messiah. And he sees Jesus. And what does he say? Here's what he says. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people, Israel. Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. He came to be the light of the world. He came to be a light to Gentiles. That's you and me. He came to be the light of people in China. He came to be a light for people in Africa. He came to be a light for people in the Amazon forest who have never heard who he is. He's the light of the whole world. And he is the hope for the whole world. We see his extension. But the third thing we see is this, his eternity. We see his eternity. He is everlasting. He says this. He says, the darkness will not overcome it. That's a wonderful truth. The darkness will not overcome this light. And when you look at over history, you will find that people have always been trying to extinguish the light of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that? The Pharisees tried to do it in the New Testament. Pilate tried to do it. We see all through history, Rome tried to do it. And in the 18th century, there was a man by the name of Voltaire. Voltaire was a French philosopher. 
Voltaire did not believe that Jesus was the son of God. He stood against Christianity. And in 1778, he declared that within 25 years, Christianity would be a thing of the past. 40 years after Voltaire died, they were printing New Testaments and Bibles in the very home that used to be his. There was another guy by the name of Frederick Nietzsche. You remember Frederick Nietzsche? In the 1900s, in 1882, in the 19th century, in 1882, to be a, a fact, Frederick Nietzsche said, God is dead. And he began to proclaim that God is dead and that the more that we begin to embrace secular humanism and we walk away from all of this supernatural dependency on some deity, humanity is going to excel and be better than it's ever been. In 1882, he says, God is dead. On August the 24th, 1900, God said, Nietzsche is dead. <laughs> Couldn't snuff it out. In the 60s, there was a guy going around. His name was the Maharishi. You remember him? Some of you may remember the Maharishi. He was from India. He was a guru for yoga. And he said that he was part of the mission of divine light. This is the guy that moved all across London and began to impact the world with transcendental meditation. People began to flock to him. They went to India to hear him. The Beatles ran down there. The, the, the Rolling Stones went that direction. The Beach Boys went there. Then all of a sudden the world is going. And he goes on a tour. And he's going on this tour all around the world claiming himself to be the mission of divine light. And if people would just follow him and listen to his transcendental meditation, men and women would be set free. But on February 8, 2004, his light was extinguished. But the light of Jesus continues on and on and on. Amen. He is the light of the world from eternity past. He is the light of the world today. And he will be the light of the world and the glory of God for the rest of all of eternity. Jesus is the light of the world. He sets this up unashamedly. You know what really gets me? I hear people all the time saying who don't believe in Christ, they say, you know, Jesus really never claimed to be God. I was like, you've never read the New Testament. You've just demonstrated your ignorance in all of biblical knowledge. He does it regularly, stating that he is the light. Now, he paints the picture. He's the light of the world. But then he gives us a contrast. Here's the second thing he teaches. Jesus declares our darkness. He speaks of our darkness. He speaks of his light, and now all of a sudden he's speaking of our darkness. He says this. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness. Now the word walk means to live. It means to abide. It means to have your living in that. And Jesus understands that left to our own sinful nature, our nature is darkness. You and I are born sinners. Listen, we are not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Amen. It's our nature. It's who we are. You don't have to teach a little child how to throw a temper tantrum. That comes completely assembled with every new barbarian that is born. <laughs> Why? Because our nature is darkness. What does that mean? Let me tell you what that means. Our hearts are darkened. Every human heart left to itself is darkened. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verse 21, he says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were what? Darkened. Every single one of us, without exception, is born with a heart that's dark. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful among all things. Who can know it? Let me tell you, the worst advice you can ever give to any human being, the worst advice you can ever give to your teenager, the worst advice you can ever give to your college student, the worst advice you can ever give to your husband or your wife is to say, Follow your heart. Because your heart will deceive you. In and of itself, our hearts are dark, but not only that, here's the second thing, our minds are darkened. Our minds are darkened. Not only does our heart darken, but from the, if our heart is the, the mainspring of all thirds, thoughts, words, actions, and deeds, then it's natural to say that our minds are darkened. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, Paul says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. Every one of us have darkened minds left to ourselves. Why? Because it comes out of our hearts. Jesus said this, from the flow overflow of the heart does the mouth speak. From the overflow of the heart does the mind think. Listen, we can come up with some great technology. We can come up with some great ingenuity. We can come up with all kinds of great answers that can be good for humanity. But here's the problem with the darkened mind. We always drift towards our own darkened pleasures for those technologies. Think how wonderful the internet is. Think how dark it can be. And think how easy it is to go to the dark places of technology because our minds in and of themselves are dark. But not only that, our deeds are darkened. So if my heart is dark, my mind is dark, then naturally the deeds are darkened as well. Paul writes in Romans 1, 28 through 31, he says, and since they do not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what they ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Then he goes on to say, not only do they approve of these things, but they approve of others doing them. You see, the problem is this, left to ourselves, you and I have dark deeds. We have dark hearts. We have dark minds. Let me tell you this. Every single person in this room, without exception, every person listening to me or wherever they're listening to me, every single person operates out of the condition of their heart. And if your heart is unredeemed, that's not to say you're going to be the worst person that you could possibly ever be, but it is saying you can never be the person God intends you to be because of the darkness of your own heart. Let me ask you this question. Do you have to look far in our culture and in our world to see the reality of this truth? You don't. All we have to do is look in our own culture and we see the darkness of human hearts and we see the incredible pain and the suffering that it can bring. Look what's happening in, in Europe right now. We've got a dark man who I believe is satanically inspired in Putin and who is killing indiscriminately men, men and women who simply just simply want to live their lives in freedom. And you've got this darkened mind, this darkened machine, this darkened ideology that is destroying life. But we have it in our culture too. You know what I was noticing? I was noticing that they had this thing in uh, Lviv. One morning, they had 300 baby strollers in the square, all empty. And all these 300 baby strollers was to symbolize the number of children that Putin killed with his war effort. And boy, it just broke my heart. And then I thought of this. Where are the empty baby strollers in front of Planned Parenthood? Where are the empty baby strollers in our own culture? We don't have a problem with that, do we? What about the crime that's raising in our own culture? What about the senselessness in our own culture? And you know what we end up seeing? We see the darkened state of humanity all around us. So here's what Jesus is saying. He's the light of the world. But left to ourselves, we are in darkness. Now, Jesus could have stopped right there, but he doesn't. And here's the thing that's so wonderful about the love of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing that's so patient about our Savior. He adds a third thing, and this is what he does. He invites us to be his disciples. We who have darkened hearts, we who have failures, we who are broken, we who in our own hearts are enemies of God, we who are driven by these perverted thoughts and minds and have sinful lives, what does he do in the midst of all of that? He invites us to be his disciples. 
He says this, but if you follow me, you will have the light of life. Yeah, I'm the light of the world. Yeah, you are in darkness, but here's the good news. I've come that you can have life. You can have the light of life and you can have your sins forgiven. You can be in a relationship with a holy God and in the midst of this broken down culture that we have, I'm inviting you to follow me. What an incredible, incredible invitation. Now, what do we have when we follow him? One is we receive forgiveness. When I submit my life to the Lordship of Christ and I follow him as a disciple, there is forgiveness, Acts 16, so that we may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive the forgiveness of their sins. I'm going to tell you what every person in this room needs. We need forgiveness, every one of us. There's not a person here who hasn't failed someone There's not a person in this room who hasn't failed themselves, and there's not a person in this room who hasn't failed God. Now, I can forgive you for hurting me. You can forgive me for hurting you, but neither one of us can forgive our offenses to a holy God. Only God can do that. And our greatest need is forgiveness, and Jesus says this. If you follow me into the light, listen, the first thing that'll happen is I will forgive every sin that separates you from the Father. And in me, there is forgiveness. But let me tell you a second thing. We're rescued from darkness. When we follow him, we step out of the darkness into the light. I love the way Paul says it in Colossians. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. I'm in the midst of darkness. I'm in the midst of depravity. I'm living by my own flesh, my own passions. All of a sudden, Jesus speaks to my heart. He invites me in. Not only does he give me forgiveness, but he says, you follow me. And now you're in the light. You're no longer in the darkness. You're no longer under the dominion of an enemy who wants to destroy your future and your life. Right now, here you are. You're walking in the light. And you're delivered from the kingdom of darkness. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you can remember your days before Jesus. I remember mine. And I remember the darkness of my mind and my heart and my deeds. And now I'm so grateful for the grace that he has. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Ask my wife. More importantly, since she's been gone, ask my dog. (laughs) He said, I can't wait for her to get back. But we all have that. Here's the third thing. We are reflections of Jesus. I love this. When Jesus says, you follow me, not only is there forgiveness, not only is there deliverance, but we become to reflect Jesus. Ephesians says this. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You are light in, you're not lights of yourself. No, no, no. You're light in him. You know what we're like as believers when we follow Christ? We step into the light. We're light in the Lord. We're like a picture of the moon. Have you seen the moon lately? It's been full. It's been brilliant. I mean, in the middle of the night, it's shining everywhere. In the morning, it's like shadows cast on the ground. That moon is bright. And we say, wow, that moon is shining. That moon is not shining. That moon has no illumination in of itself. That moon only reflects the light from the sun. And the same is true of you and me. We don't have the light in and of ourselves. But when I walk with Jesus, let me tell you what happens. His light shines through me. And when his light shines through me, let me tell you what people see. They see Jesus. And you know what's really interesting? The people who knew me before Jesus are amazed. The people who knew the old Phil Lordigo, who used to do all the drugs and the alcohol and all that stuff. When I first came to faith in Christ, people were like, wow, man, your life really changed. Here's what they said to me. Oh, it's a phase. You'll get over it. That's been 44 years ago. I still haven't gotten over it. And here's the thing. We get to be the light of the world. Listen, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You, speaking of believers, are the light of the world. He is saying that we get to be what he has been. 
He is the light of the world, but now he's calling us light of the world. Why? Because his light is shining through us. And every single day that you and I live, there's the opportunity for us to reflect the goodness of God all around us. We get to be lights. I think a lot of times we forget that because we still have the residual effect of the old person. I still had the residual effect. You know, I told my staff, I said, when I turned 60, the most disappointing thing to me was I thought I would be much further along spiritually than I am. I still struggle with the same things, the same thoughts. I have to die to those same things. I thought I would be over all of that. But every day is a willful choice to live for him and to allow my light to shine. Several years ago, I was in a hospital making a visit. We're, we still are not fully back to making visits as pastors. But I was in the hospital one day and I walked in an elevator and these two nurses came in there. And this one nurse was talking to the other nurse and the, obviously the one girl didn't go to church and the other nurse went to church. And she begins the conversation by saying, hey, do you go to church anywhere? She says, no, I don't go to church. I haven't found one yet. And she said, well, whatever you do, don't come to my church. She said, what do you mean? I hate my church. I hate everything about it. I hate the music. I hate the preacher. I hate the, mu the, the ministries. I just hate going there. And the nurse looks at her and she says, oh, wow. She steps off and the nurse is standing there by herself and I'm in the elevator and I looked at her and I said, you don't go to Scott's Hill, do you? <laughs> she said, no, why? I said, just don't. Just don't. <laughs> I may not get all through the rest of this message, but here's what I want to I end on. Listen carefully. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. If you're a child of God this morning, listen to me. You were in darkness and the light of the world invited you into a relationship with him. He forgave you your sins. Not only did he do that, he pulled you out of darkness and placed him in light and he has now made you the light of the world. And when we forget what the Lord Jesus did, and the depth of what he did. And we wrongly let our light shine. It grieves his heart for everything he's done. For us not to represent him well. You're the light. Jesus went to the cross that we could be delivered from darkness. Jesus went to the cross that he might die, that we might be life. Jesus went to the cross that darkness could be removed from us and the light of his very character and the brilliance of his kind of love and compassion would shine through for us. And God forbid that we should ever be that nurse. that would undermine the work of what Jesus has called us to do for his own glory. You see, in the midst of all this, while Jesus makes this contrast and he calls us to be the light, there are people who still reject it. Here's the fourth thing. Some will deny his claims. Some will deny his claims. This is what's amazing, that even though Jesus does all of these things, he, he, he didn't have to invite us into a relationship, but he demonstrates his incredible love for us in the midst of all of that, that some people will still turn their back. And I can tell you this, there's some who are listening to me right now online. There's some who are in this own room who say, listen, I heard it all before. I heard it all before. You haven't convinced me any more than anything else I've ever heard about Jesus. And you will walk out of here denying the claims of Jesus Christ. That's what the, the, the Pharisees did. So the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is what? Not true. It's not true. How does Jesus respond to him? I love it. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. 
You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. He goes on. He says, in your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself. And the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And here's how they respond. They said to him, where is your father? Where's your father? They completely missed it. You see, they thought they knew where Jesus was from. They thought Jesus was from Nazareth. That's where he was raised, but it's not where he was born. They said, the Messiah cannot come from Nazareth. You're right. I was born in Bethlehem. And you missed that. Oh, we know your father, Joseph. And by the fact of asking that question, they know about his history. And they are accusing him of being an illegitimate son. But they knew that not either. And you know what Jesus doesn't do? Listen carefully. He doesn't correct them. Why? Because he knows it wouldn't change their minds. Because they have already denied him. They've turned their back. And there's no amount of facts or no amount of truth that will ever turn their hearts to believe what he has said. I'm going to tell you, there are people in our culture. There are people in this church. There are people in every single church who week after week after week after week hear the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they turn their back. They say, I don't believe it. I can't believe it. I don't think it's right. It doesn't make sense. It goes against everything that I understand logically speaking coming from a mind that's darkened and I can't have anything to do with it. And what Jesus did, he just didn't even waste his time with them because he knew it would make a difference. Have you ever met people in your life where you've told them the truth of the gospel over and over and over and they push back and they push back and they have nothing to do with it? I had a man in my life one time that he was dying of cancer. His wife called me. She had been coming to this church. Can you come meet with my husband? I went to his house. He's from Louisiana. We hit it off really well because I'm from Louisiana. We began to talk about all the Cajun things and laugh and everything. I even would go to Carabas and buy Bluebell ice cream before you could buy it here. And I'd bring him Bluebell ice cream because it was his favorite ice cream. He was a sociology professor who knew all about humanity, knew all about all of these things of societies. And I would share the gospel with them, share the gospel with them. And he would say, I know that sounds right. I know it sounds right, but I cannot believe it because of my intellect. That man died without Christ. I did his funeral. And I couldn't say a word about his relationship with Christ because he knew it, he knew it, he denied it, and he walked away from it. Jesus answered them and said, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Let me just quickly give you the last point. All who reject Jesus will die in their darkness. All who reject Jesus will die in their darkness. Three times in two verses, Jesus tells the Pharisees this. In verse 21, he says, so he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. They're thinking, oh, he's going to go kill himself. He's going to commit suicide. So he says it to him again in verse 24. I told you that you would die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Listen, the same claim that Jesus said to the Pharisees, he's saying to us today, I'm the light of the world. If you follow me, you will have the light of life. And you will be the light of the world. But if you deny me and you go your way, you will die in your darkness. And there will be no hope. There will be no second chance. There will be no purgatory. There will be no place for you to work off your sins. When you take your last breath, your eternity is sealed forever. And I want to tell you, the Lord Jesus is here today and he's reminding believers, walk in the light. Let your light so shine before men that they might see my good, your good works and glorify my Father in heaven. Let your light shine in such a way that people will be encouraged by what I've done in you. And you be the light 
that points them to me. But if you're here this morning and you've heard the truth and you've pushed it and you've pushed it and you've denied it and you've walked away, my friend, there's going to come a time when you take your last breath. You will either die in the Lord or you will die in darkness. And the King of Kings is here today to tell you, I've already died for you. I've died for you. I've done everything there is to do to provide you an opportunity to be restored with the Father and to walk in the light. And you would think, you would think that people who are in darkness and who are in the domain of Satan see the light of Jesus Christ. They see the freedom. You would think they would run to the light. But Jesus says, no. You see, they love darkness too much to give it up. And the darkness that they walk in, they think is the light. And yet it is the snare of the enemy that will keep them there for eternity. So the question is, where are you walking today? And the challenge is to run to him. Child of God, you are light. Be light. Let the Lord Jesus so flow through you that you become a testimony to a darkened world where people will run to you and say, tell me, what is different about you? Unbeliever, this is not a message of condemnation. This is a message of truth and hope. That Jesus is your hope. And he's calling you today to surrender to him. He is the light of the world. And he will always be the light of the world. Would you stand together? Would you stand as I lead us in prayer? I want every head bowed, every eye closed. Child of God, will you make a commitment afresh today to walk in the light as he is in the light that your fellowship may be with him. Walk in the light. Let the light of Jesus Christ so shine through you that they see the king of kings in all of his glory. If you're here this morning without Christ, my friend, this is an encouraging message that in the stark contrast of our lives in Jesus, that he calls us to follow. There's not a person in this room that hasn't been where you are. Every one of us who walks in the light were brought out of darkness. And now the Lord Jesus is calling you. Would you would you come to him? Would you run to him and surrender to him today that he might forgive you? He might remove you from the dominion of darkness and he would give you the light of life. Father, I pray for all of us this morning. And Father, as we close this message out and this service out with a song and we sing about the King of Kings and the light of the world. Father, if there are those who need to come to this altar this morning as we're singing, they may just come and thank you for saving them. Thank you for what you have done. Or maybe, Father, they come to pray for others who will not keep denying and walking away from the truth. Oh, Father, if there are those here this morning who need a Savior, that they would come down here and just fall before him at this place and say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you. Thank you for loving me. I surrender everything to you this morning. Father, whatever it is you're calling us to do, would we walk in obedience this morning to you? And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.